But one of my passions, and you guys all know this, is to amplify scriptures using Greek and Hebrew lexicons. And I took a whole year to do the entire book of Revelation, one word at a time, pulling the definitions from the Thayer's lexicon, which is the lexicon that they used to do the Amplified Bible New Testament with. And what I found very, very interesting is what happens with the bride after the rapture of the church. After she goes up into the throne room, what happens with her? And so I've written a teaching, and it's got scriptures from all over the Bible. It's not just the book of Revelation. But I need to tell you first about the honeymoon chamber in an ancient Jewish marriage real quickly. When the husband and the wife went into the honeymoon chamber, they stayed in there for one week to get to know each other. And at the end of the week, they would come out into the main house. It was in a house that they had the honeymoon chamber, the father's house. They would come out into the house with the father and the family and the wedding guests, and they would have a marriage feast at that point after being a week in the honeymoon chamber. Well, we flip-flop it. We have the reception, which is our marriage feast, first, and then we go to the honeymoon to consummate the marriage. And the reason they flip-flopped it is because... When they went into the honeymoon chamber and they laid the virginity cloth on the bed, if there was no blood on the cloth and it could be attested to by two or more witnesses that she had not remained pure while her husband was away or her groom was away preparing a place for her, then there was no marriage feast. The very next morning she was taken back to her father's house, put on the doorstep, and the men of the town would stone her to death. So... How many of us, <laughs> when we go to heaven, which is our honeymoon chamber, how many of us would pass the purity test? How many of us from the day that we got saved have maintained God's righteous standard every single day? Yeah. None of us. But did you know that the groom could step in and take the wife's punishment if it was found that she wasn't? Uh, a virgin, she had not maintained her purity on purpose. He could stop the men from killing her, stand in her place, and receive her punishment of death, which is exactly what Christ did for us before we were even born, because he knew we were never going to pass the purity test when we get to the honeymoon chamber of heaven. Um, in Deuteronomy 22, verses 20 and 21, this is New Living Translation. And it says, but suppose the man's accusations are true and he can show that she was not a virgin. The woman must be taken to the door of her father's home and there the men of the town must stone her to death. For she has committed a disgraceful crime in Israel by being promiscuous while living in her parents' home. In this way, you will purge this evil from among you. Well, we are technically and spiritually married to Jesus, the day we asked him to be our Lord and Savior, he became our husband. So he's away preparing a place for us, and we are still living at our parents' home, which is planet Earth. Amen. And we're supposed to be maintaining our purity as if we are married already to Jesus. And when he comes back to take us back to the honeymoon chamber, we need to know what that's going to look like for us <laughs> because we are the unfaithful bride who has not maintained her purity. Thank goodness for the cross. Amen. But we need to know what it's going to look like for us when we go up at the rapture of the church. When the seventh trumpet blows, Christ is going to send his angels to gather the bride from one end of the earth to the other. And he's going to take his bride to the father's house, lead her into the honeymoon chamber, which is actually called in the ancient Jewish marriage ceremony, the hoopah. Um, so we're going to go to the hoopah of heaven, which I believe is the throne room area, and we are going to be spiritually undressed, spiritually unveiled before Jesus, sins and all. And then after a week in the honeymoon chamber, we're going to come out, after we get to know our groom a lot better, we're going to get to come out of the hoopah with our veil removed, and then we are going to go before, I believe, the judgment after <laughs> The honeymoon chamber. So I think we'll we be found blameless in the hoopah. <laughs> no, not a one of us is going to be found blameless. But his blood technically is on the virginity cloth for us. 
He died for us. His blood covers our sins. So thank goodness that is going to be what we get to experience is seeing um, our sins, our, our unfaithfulness, basically washed away as we're in that honeymoon chamber. In Colossians 1.22, this is the New Living Translation. It says, yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Thank goodness that he did that for us. That's a beautiful promise. So what I'm going to teach tonight is what happens in that honeymoon chamber that makes us go from impure (laughs) to blameless without spot or wrinkle. And what I have found, this is what I have found, I believe that we're going to go through a purification by fire up there. And I know that sounds bizarre because you're like, "Hmm." so I'm going to show you these scriptures. And it's really, really neat how I found them. And I was actually studying the book of Revelation when I came across it. Because I've always heard that when we stand up there, the fire of God is going to come down and judge our works. And some of them are going to burn up like wood, hay, and stubble. So I always knew about this fire of God judging our works. I just never really knew what it was going to, how it was going to happen, where it was going to happen, and what it was going to look like until I studied Revelation. And there's a group of people that are going to go through this before we do. And so Revelation 4.1, this is John. John is on the Isle of Patmos. He's the last living disciple of Jesus. He's been imprisoned by the Romans, and he's basically sent there to die. Until Jesus and some angels come and visit John on the island and start to give him the book of Revelation, which is the plans and purposes for God for mankind. <laughs> and so here's John. He's, he's on this island. All of a sudden, he's got Jesus. He's got seven angels with him. And then in chapter four, John hears a voice in heaven. And it says, after this, now this has been amplified, all the scriptures tonight, um, amplified to the Greek from the Greek definitions put into the verses. So Revelation 4.1, after this, I looked and I saw a door which accessed God's eternal kingdom of heaven. It was opened, and the first voice I heard, whom I could not see, was like a trumpet talking to me, saying, come up to this place, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. What we need to understand is John went up in that vision in the year 95, 96 AD. Christ was crucified in the spring of 30 AD, 65 years after the crucifixion. John gets to go up into the throne room of heaven in some sort of a spiritual state. It says, and I was immediately, verse 2 through 11, I was immediately under the power of the Spirit in a state of inspiration, and I saw a throne. Now, guys, take a mental note of what John sees when he gets up into the throne room of heaven. I saw a throne setting in heaven, the highest dwelling place of God, and one sat on the throne. He had the appearance of jasper and translucent red sardine stone. There was a rainbow all around the throne that was the color of green emeralds. And around the throne of God were 24 thrones. And upon those thrones I saw 24 elders, which were the members of the heavenly Sanhedrin, or court. They were clothed in white garments, and on their heads were golden crowns marking their exalted rank. And from the throne of God there broke forth lightning, thunder, voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, representing the seven energies or operations of the Holy Spirit. And before the throne there was a a sea of glass like crystal, and in and around the throne of God were four creatures full of eyes in front and behind. And the first creature was like a lion, with characteristics alluding to strength, courage, and cruelty. The second creature was like a calf, denoting the idea of anything young, tender, and delicate. The third creature had the face like a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four creatures had six wings each, and they were full of eyes within. And they continually said day and night on account of God's incomparable majesty, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty! who was and is and is to come. And when those four creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to God, the 24 elders would lay prostrate before God and they would worship him and they would cast their crowns before God saying, thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and power for you have created everything. And for the pleasure of what you had determined and wished to be done, those things are 
and were created. Yes. If you can just imagine what John saw, <laughs> he sees God on a throne. You know, he's expecting to see Jesus. It's been 65 years. You know, he's wanting to see him. He sees him in chapter 5. But he sees God. He sees a rainbow, a green rainbow. He sees seven lamps burning, which are the Holy Spirit's operations. He sees 24 elders. He sees four angels that have um, different faces, six wings, and they're worshiping God. But he sees the sea of glass. And here's what I picture. I picture being out on an enormous lake that is just smooth, just the smoothest water from as far as you can see. But his, this sea is like crystal clear glass for as far as his eyes can see. Partway through the tribulation, he starts seeing people accumulating on the sea of glass. And they are the 144,000 who are mentioned in the book of Revelation. These 144,000 martyrs, the witnesses that are going to stay behind in Israel and Jerusalem during the tribulation, they're going to lay their lives down. They're already sealed and marked. This is their destiny. Before the first trumpet ever blows, the angel of God comes down with the signet ring of God and literally seals 144,000 people from the tribes of Jacob over there. They're going to stay behind when the heat gets started. And they are going to, when they lay down their lives for Jesus, they're going to go to the throne room of heaven with him. And John sees them. He doesn't see all of them. But in chapter 6, no, sorry, yes, um, Revelation 6, <laughs> starting in verse 9, it says, And when he opened the fifth seal. Now I'm going to take a pause real quick because when you study the book of Revelation, there's a series of seven seals. There's also a series of seven trumpets. And a lot of people think that the seals open consecutively first, and then the trumpets start blowing after that. That's not how the, the parallel timelines work. The seals are opening at the same time the trumpets are blowing. They cover the exact same three and a half year period of time in the tribulation. The seventh seal opens as the seventh trumpet blows. They are the exact same um, event. But the seals identify key players, key people that are going to be identified within this three and a half year period. The trumpets identify key events that are going to be happening in this three and a half year period, both of them running simultaneously beside each other. So getting back to Revelation 6, 9. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of incense, with incense, which stood in the holy place in heaven, the disembodied souls of those who were violently put to death for the word of God and for holding on strongly to their testimony that Jesus was their Messiah. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you demand punishment for our blood and enforce the penalty of murder on those who inhabit the lands? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should keep quiet and calm and patient expectation for a little while longer until a certain number of others who acknowledged Jesus as Lord and obeyed his commands were killed as they were. The 144,000 start accumulating as they are being killed in the throne room. And in the fifth seal, we identify that key group of people. But they're not all up there yet. Not all 144,000 are killed yet. And so they're crying out, how much longer, Lord, until you exact punishment and pour out your wrath on those people who took our lives? He's like, when the last of the 144,000 is up here with me, then my wrath will be poured out on the wicked and the unbelieving but not until then. And so you see these 144,000 as we progress through Revelation, and I'll get to the point of why we're even talking about them. Um, they start to accumulate more and more and more. In Revelation 7, 9 through 17, amplified with the Greek definitions put in, we're further into the tribulation. After this, John <laughs> says, I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language. Standing in front of the throne before the Lamb. They're on that sea of glass in the throne room. They were clothed with white robes and they held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar. Now they're shouting. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and they worshiped God 
And they sang, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Then one of the 24 elders asked me, well, who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? And I, John, said to him, sir, you're the one who knows. And then he said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun. For the Lamb of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So now we've got more accumulating in the throne room. And they're no longer saying, how much longer? Now they're just worshiping him because they know the time is getting near for Christ's return. But this crowd is not the whole church. This crowd is specifically identified as the martyrs who laid down their life during the tribulation period. They're the ones that are up there worshiping on this sea of glass. But then as we get right down towards the end, really close to the return of Christ, I caught something with this group of martyrs that hasn't been happening to them before, but it's happening to them at the very, very end, the, the close of the tribulation. It's found in Revelation 15, verses 2 and 3, amplified with the Greek put in. And I saw something that had the appearance of a sea of glassy transparency, which was mixed with fire and Christians who held fast to their faith even unto death against the power of their enemies their temptations and their persecutions and thereby freed themselves from the power of the beast and from the statue that was in his likeness from his mark and from the number of his name they stood on the sea of glass they had harps by which the praises of God were sung and they sang the song which Moses the servant whose services God employed to execute his divine purposes, taught them. And the song which Jesus, the Lamb of God, also taught them, saying, Great are your works, Lord God, who rules over all things, both amazing and terrifying. You execute the laws of your government and the law concerning the pardoning of, your, of sins perfectly. You are God. You are the supreme ruler of all of the saints. So here we see all of them. But there's a sea of glass that they're standing on. They're worshiping God now. They're playing harps. But there's a fire that's mixed in that sea of glass. Mm -hmm. And I believe that they are being purified right before the return of Christ. And there's a reason. Because when the tribulation is over, and I've got goosebumps in my cheeks. When the tribulation is over, they get brought back to life mm -hmm. after they're judged by those 24 elders. And they get to come back onto the planet and rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. What an amazing reward for the 144,000 that stay behind in the heat of the tribulation and lay it down for Jesus. And he's got, he's got just so much to offer them. If you even study the millennial kingdom, the verses are all through the Old Testament. You just have to find them. It is amazing what <coughs> Jerusalem and Israel is going to look like during the millennial kingdom. So here's the judgment that these 120, I mean, 144,000 are going to go through. Revelation 20, verse 4. Here's what John sees. I saw tribunal thrones, that's your 24 elders, and those who sat upon them, and they were given the power to judge. And I saw the disembodied souls of those who were beheaded for following Jesus and for sharing the doctrine of attaining through Christ salvation in the kingdom of God. They had not worshipped the Antichrist or the statue made in his likeness, nor had they allowed themselves to receive the mark of the beast on their forehead or on their right hand. They came back to life and lived again and ruled and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Yeah. They were worshipping during the purification process. They weren't hopping and skipping because their feet were hot. They were playing the harps, and they were Amen. worshiping him. And the angels were excited. Now, I'm going to enlighten you on a, a passage of scripture from Ezekiel. I've heard this scripture used to teach other principles of the Bible. 
But when you know what this passage of scripture is really talking about, from what I just taught you, it makes so much more sense. Um, Ezekiel 37 is the chapter, but I'm just going to read a few verses out of them from the New American Standard Bible. I'm going to read verse 4 through 6. This is about the millennial kingdom and the 144,000 being brought to life and being placed back in their land. Ezekiel 37, 4 through 6. And again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life and I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and you will know that I am the Lord. Verses 10 through 14. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they came to life, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope has perished. We're completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you in your own land. And then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and done it, declares the Lord. Verses 25 through 28. They will live in the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived. And they will live in it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them, and I will be their God. They will be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst wow. forever. Oh, dry bones is the millennial... Kingdom, 144,000 being brought back to life and getting to rule and reign with Christ. And man, that's an amazing, amazing reward. So when Christ finishes the end of the three and a half year tribulation, he's going to, and the 144,000 are up there. I believe they're his honored guests. They're going to get on the white horse and they're going to come up with him to meet the bride in the clouds. But God, Christ, is going to return in the clouds. He's going to raise the dead. Christians, he's going to rapture the bride who are alive and remain, and they're going to be taken into the throne room to the hoopah where I believe that sea of glass is, so that they too can stand and be purified before the judgment. In Ecclesiastes 12 14, New Living, it says, God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. I'm sorry. I'm taught as a child, oh, they're going to be up on the big screen. And you're going to be like in this huge coliseum and everybody's going to be watching while you're not like, oh, no. That's not what it's going to look like. Especially if the fire is beneath us and we're playing harps and worshiping. <laughs> I think we're going to see through Christ's eyes and remember every single thing. But I don't believe everybody in there is going to be looking around at everybody's big screen. That's not how it's going to play out. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15. This is my main scripture. Amplified with the Greek definitions put in. Anything thought about, accomplished, or produced shall become known, for the day shall declare it. On the day of judgment, it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test, try, and scrutinize it to see whether it is genuine or not. If his works do not perish in the fire, which has been built on the foundation already laid, he will receive what is given as a reward, which God bestows upon good deeds and endeavors. And if his accomplishments shall be consumed by the fire, well, he, he shall sustain damage, receive injury, and suffer loss. But he himself will receive eternal blessedness in heaven by the saving influence of God. But he will not make it through this large destructive fire without damage. Now, I don't think the damage is physical damage because we're going to be in our glorified bodies. But I believe that the loss is more what he's talking about. When we see those works, those dead works um, burning away, and we realize how many things we could have done differently, 
we may want to go back and redo. <laughs> really wasted a lot of time. You know, I think that that's going to be the loss that we suffer. It's just all those things were just dead works. We just wasted so much time on things that had no eternal value whatsoever. But those are going to be burned away, guys. And what you're going to be left with are the good works, the things that actually counted in heaven. Um, but even during our purification process, it says the angels are praising God because they know we're going to come out as the bride spotless. In Revelation 19, 6 through 9, amplified from the Greek, and I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, and like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia for the Lord God omnipotent, who holds dominion and rule over all things. He reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has prepared herself, and she is permitted permitted to be dressed in fine linen, clean and white, for while, for fine linen represents the righteous acts of the Christians. And the angel said unto me, Right, blessed and congratulated are they who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb, for it symbolizes their salvation. And this supper will celebrate the marriage of Christ with his spiritual bride at the inauguration of his kingdom. These are the true words and promises of God. You see, when we go into the honeymoon chamber with Jesus, it's very similar to the hoopah that the Jewish couple goes into. We will spiritually unveil before him. We won't be found pure. Our sins will be exposed. By Jewish law, we should receive the death penalty. But instead of the fire of hell, we get the purifying fire of God who burns away our sins and leaves us spotless so that we can be permitted to wear white and get to go into the marriage feast by the saving influence of God through Christ we will receive eternal blessedness instead of death Hallelujah. I'm going to read Colossians 1 22 again but in NIV but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation you see, Revelation isn't a picture of God's wrath. It's a picture of his love, if you understand the book. According to ancient Jewish tradition, we will stay in the honeymoon chamber for a week. If we follow that, we will be in the honeymoon chamber on that sea of glass being purified for one seven-day period. As the, fire, as the fire burns away our sins, we're going to be left with our righteous deeds. By the end, we will be found worthy to wear white. We will come out of the honeymoon chamber, and that's when I believe we will go before the judgment seat. I believe we're going to go through the purifying fire first. Because <laughs> otherwise, um, we'd be in trouble at the judgment seat. But I wonder what is going to be left when all of my dead works burn up. I wonder what I did down here that had eternal value up there. And so that brings me to the teaching tonight. And it is about the judgment seat of Christ. The Bema seat. You guys heard the Bema seat? That's the Greek word for judgment. In ancient um, Grecian games, how they would award these athletes, think of our Olympics, but ancient Greece. The athletes would compete in a certain event or race under close scrutiny of a judge, and they had to compete by the rules. They're very specific rules, like think of the Olympics. They get scored for every little thing. And then at the end, the winner would go before the Bama seat for their award, not for punishment, for their reward. They would get a laurel wreath um, put around their heads, like the FTD floral delivery gun. You know, he has a little leaf thing. Okay, that's the kind of crown they're competing for. We are competing for an inc and like an incorruptible, imperishable crown is what we are running and competing for. Paul makes several references to Christians running the race and fighting the fight, but for an imperishable crown. Well, I wanted to know what this imperishable crown was when we all like. So Paul says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is 2 Corinthians 5.10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, 
or in the body, whether good or bad. So I was taught in heaven, this is what I was taught as a little girl, that um, I'm going to get a, a crown, a golden crown, and then I was told, I'm just going to rat out my mom, I was told that for every good deed that I did quietly, that I was going to get a jewel in my crown. And then when I stood before Jesus and I got my crown with all my jewels in it, I was going to take it off my head. I was going to lay it at Jesus' feet, and I was going to say to him, this is for you. This is what I did for you. This is how much I loved you. And talk about making an impression in my little brain. She says, but if you get your accolades here, if you get your little, you know, clap, clap, good for you on earth, then you're not going to get a jewel in your crown for that one because you already got your reward while you're here on earth. And then I was brought to Matthew 6, 1 through 4, and it says, Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. And when you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. And the word reward is misthos in the Greek. Definition of this, the rewards which God will bestow upon good deeds and endeavors. So we know that there's going to be some sort of reward for good deeds and endeavors that you didn't get your accolades here for on this earth. What do they look like? Well, of course, they're the crowns with all the jewels in them, right? So I grew up listening to country gospel and bluegrass. And there was a group called the Cox Family. I don't know if you guys, any of you ever listen to the Cox Family? <coughs> Very country. And they sang a song, Will There Be Any Stars in My Crown? <laughs> Will there be any stars, any stars in my crown, when at evening the sun goeth down, when I wake with the blessed in those mansions of rest? Will there be any stars in my crown? And so as a little girl, I always wondered, is there going to be any stars in my crown? Because my mom always taught me it was jewels, but apparently these guys are saying there's going to be some stars. I mean, it's just this little pretty princess with my crown with all my stuff in it. <laughs> So, and then I went through high school Bible with my father. He was our Bible teacher. And there's this poem that I pulled from my Bible notes. And it said, which made me like scared I wasn't even going to get a crown. It said, he would have me rich, but I stand here poor, stripped of all but his grace. And memory will flash like a sorrowful thing down the years I can't retrace. And my remorseful heart will quietly break with tears I cannot shed. And I will cover my face with my empty hands and bow my uncrowned head. And I thought, by golly, I am not going to get up there. <laughs> I have nothing to give to Jesus. I am going to start working for my crown and my jewels and my star or whatever it is. I'm going to do all kinds of nice things for people. I'm going to do it quiet. And when I had children, don't think I didn't tell them at a very young age how important it was to, to get those good deeds in. But don't tell anybody. And so Chelsea, she's five years old. Michelle's seven. I'm going through Walmart. I'm broke. I'm on wicked food stamps. You know, me and Jim were just early married. We were so broke. And I've got my few little things of, you know, Cheerios and milk going down the thing. And all of a sudden I see this smiley face cookie, this huge hockey puck smiley face cookie coming down the conveyor. And I thought it just fell off, the gum thingy. So I pick it up and I'm like, just reached across the conveyor belt. And I hear this little, <laughs> and I turn and I see little Chelsea with her, pouty lips sticking out. And, and I said, Chelsea, did you put that up there? And she's like, yes, I wanted to get it for Michelle. And I said, well, honey, I can't afford that. Mommy can't afford that cookie. She goes, oh, thanks a lot, Mom. There goes the jewel in my crown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to have me pay for it. Um, but she was going to get her jewel. Um, we paying for it. So imagine... When I started researching, now that I know how to look up things in Greek, when I started researching the crowns, I was like, I cannot wait to figure out <laughs> what those reward, those crowns are going to look like in heaven. So I'm going to teach you tonight. Ready? The first one is the crown of righteousness. There is five. The crown of righteousness found in 2 Timothy 4.8. 
Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. Second crown, the imperishable crown, goes by a couple names depending on what translation. It's either the incorruptible crown or the victor's crown. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25, this is New King James. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Temperate means disciplined. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. Oh, Laurel, read your thing. But we for an imperishable crown. Third crown, crown of life. Found, uh, it's found twice, but I'm just going to give you James 1.12. New King James. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So I'm like, okay. Uh, avoid temptation, loving. Another crown. Boy, I'm racking up crowns. I can get three so far. Plus, I'm only going to get one. Just apparently, there's lots that you can accumulate up there. Number four, the crown of glory, the shepherd's crown. I was always taught this is for pastors only. 1 Peter 5, 4, King James Version, that's what I was taught. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory, which will never fade away. Okay, what I found may surprise you, <clears throat> may upset you, may excite you. No, there's five crowns, but I'm going to get to the fifth one a little bit later. But thank you. There are five. What I found is that none of these crowns are literal. They're not literal gold crowns that you get jewels in. I know. Um, the only people that have real crowns laying them at Jesus' feet is back in chapter 4 of Revelation when we saw the 24 elders. They had literal gold crowns on. They were laying those crowns at God's feet. But when I looked up the word crown for all of these verses... The crown of rejoicing, the imperishable crown, the crown of glory, the crown of life. They were all metaphors for something much bigger, much better, but a metaphor. Oh, look. You guys ready? Drum roll. Don't hate me. Don't hate me. The crowns that we will receive, all of them mean the same thing. The eternal blessedness, which will be given as a prize to the genuine servants of God in Christ. The crown, which is the reward for righteousness. Eternal blessedness is our crown. Our calling is to, uh, take a breath. It's okay. If you don't agree with me, that's fine. My mom does not. She goes, I don't care what you say. I'm getting my crown. My mom, get your crown. I'll take eternal blessedness. Our calling is to get saved. And then to help other people get saved yeah. so that they can all get eternal blessedness in heaven as their reward. So if you are saved and you love his appearing, you will get the crown of righteousness, which is eternal blessedness in heaven. If we are saved and we run the race well, we will get an imperishable crown, which is eternal blessedness in heaven. Yeah. If we are saved and we endure trials and temptations and we love him, we will receive a crown of life which is eternal blessedness in heaven. And if the chief shepherd gives us a crown of glory, we were saved <laughs> and we just received eternal blessedness in heaven. As our reward, does that make sense? Yes. yes. It makes so much sense. Jesus doesn't need a bunch of gold crowns getting laid at his feet. The streets are paved with it. There's plenty of gold. We are going to receive eternal blessedness as our crown our imperishable reward. Now there's um, one more crown. It's a little bit different in the definition, and it is so beautiful. It's, that's why I saved it for last. It's the crown of rejoicing, which is the soul winner's crown. And it is found in First Thess if I can say it, Thessalonians 2, verses 19 and 20 in New King James. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ who is coming? For you are our glory and our joy. And when I looked up the Greek word stephanos, same Greek word as it has been, it is eternal blessedness in heaven. 
but it also has a little added notation to this particular crown only. And it says it is a metaphor for persons being an ornament of honor to one. Wow. And I'm like, when I wrapped my brain around what that sentence meant, your crown of rejoicing, when you get there with everybody else, you're going to recognize every single person that is there because of something that you did. You may never know this side of heaven, the impact that you made on somebody's life, but when you get there, they will be your chillbones. They will be your ornament of honor gathered around you. Thank you. That song. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm here because of you, because you witnessed to me. You may plant a seed, Carol, in somebody, some little kid's life. And years later, somebody else will water that seed and they will get saved. Yeah. Guess what? He that planteth and he that watereth yeah. are the same and they each get their reward. Why? Yes. Because they all had something to do with that person being up there. So your ornament of honor is people surrounding you. And that is your crown of rejoicing. Is that not beautiful? Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. beautiful. Like, I love these Greek definitions. So beautiful. So the crowns aren't literal. They're metaphors for something way better, in my opinion. But God does bestow rewards for good deeds and endeavors. So if it's not the crowns, what is it? And so I think I have found some possibilities. Um, 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. This was my high school. This was my life verse in high school. You know, because when you're all like an emotional teenager. And, oh, I just, you know, life is horrible. <laughs> okay, so my life verse was this. In all of this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a while, you may have to have suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuine, genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Mm. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And he's always in this I greatly rejoice. And my faith which is of greater worth than gold. It's going to be refined by the, it can be refined by fire. It's going to result in praise, glory, and honor. Well, I knew what praise was. I know what praise is. And then glory and honor, and I'm thinking, glory and honor, what is that going to look like in heaven? Praise, glory, and honor. Okay, so I think I found something to do with the glory. 1 Corinthians 15, 40 through 44. This is King James. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial, which is angelic beings, is different than the glory of the terrestrial, which means outer space, like sun, moon, stars. Those They differ in shininess and brilliance, glory. And it says there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in their glowing, in their glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Well, that's us. For it is sown when we go into the grave. It, that's what it means when we are sown, when we're into the ground again because we've died. It is sown in corruption, but it is raised in incorruption. Amen. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body. It is raised in a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. So it appears to me that part of our reward is going to be our glorified bodies. <laughs> Some really good glorified bodies. But from what I have found, those bodies are going to shine at different brilliances based on what we did here on this earth. Here's, here's the verses that I found that make me think this. Could be wrong, but Daniel 12, 3. This is amplified with Hebrew definitions put back into it. And they who are, so let's see if you fall into this category. 
they who are religiously reverent, upright, and devout. Any of you religiously reverent, upright, devout? It says, will shine forth brilliantly as the sky, or the brightness of the sky of blue sapphire. Those who turn many to uprightness, religious reverence, and devoutness by their example and doctrine. So now, if, if you help other people turn their lives around and they start living a life of religious reverence, devoutness, because of your example and your doctrine, it says they will shine like the stars for eternity after the resurrection. So we've got people that are going to be in the brilliance of the blue sky. You've got people whose glorified bodies apparently will shine like the stars. And when I was reading Revelation, when I was studying the churches, in Revelation 2, when he was talking to the church at Thyatira, which is the deceived church, and they were falling into false doctrines, and there were some in Thyatira that weren't, but they were being killed for it. And he says to them in Thyatira, he says, Revelation 2, this is 25 through 28 in the NIV, he says, hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. And so when I looked into the Greek to see what this victorious person that does the will of God till the very end, he gets the morning star. I want to know what's the morning star. Proinos aster. I will give to him who overcomes the morning star that he may be irradiated with its splendor and I will cause his heavenly glory to outshine all others. Not that we're going to run around going, I shine brighter than you. We're not going to do that. We're not going to have a bunch of crowns competing against jewels. And we're not going to do any of that. We're going to be in our glorified bodies, fellowshipping and worshiping with one another with Jesus, with God, with the angels, it's going to be not about competition, not about anything other than Jesus Amen. and eternal blessedness with our Savior. Amen. So I had Ecro and had to tell my daughter, she was in high school, when I found out. I taught her wrong about those crowns. <laughs> I said, Charles, come here. See about those crowns. Um, yeah, apparently they're literal, not literal, they're metaphors. Um, <laughs> She's like, Mom! <laughs> she goes, I can think of five things right now that I did privately that nobody ever knew I did so that I could at least have some jewels on my crown. She's all dramatic. She's like, fine. I'm just going to go to bedazzle my trumpet so I can start blowing it telling everybody I'm going to get a crown. <laughs> You're so silly. You still do good things in private. That's still a godly thing. Amen. So, um, in my uh, in my years of studying, I've come across so many verses that have to do with our purpose, our goal, and so I've amplified them all. And I'm going to just re read them in a string. I'll give you the um, the references, but I'm going to kind of read them like a story. But they've all been amplified. Romans eight eighteen. I consider and take into account that the external sufferings, misfortunes, calamities, evils, and afflictions of this limited time, when the whole order of things will be reformed, are not to be put in equality with the glorious condition of blessedness, into which it is appointed and promised that true Christians shall enter after their Savior's return from heaven. Those things I suffered for, either by fixed necessity or by divine appointment, will be revealed then. Ephesians 5, 14 through 17. Wherefore, he says, arise from a state of moral sloth to an act of life devoted to God, you who yield to sin and are indifferent about your salvation. Arise from your spiritual death and Christ will pour upon you the light of divine truth as the sun gives light to men aroused from sleep. Take heed that you conduct yourself carefully, deviating in no respect from the law of duty. Do not be foolish, but in your actions be governed by religious reverence, devoutness, and integrity. Make wise use of every opportunity for doing good, because the days are full of peril to Christians' faith and steadfastness. Therefore, be ye not unwise, but understand what God has purposed and determined that you shall do to bless mankind through Christ. Luke 12, 43 and 44. Blessed is that servant when his Lord, when he cometh, shall find him doing rightly and doing good. 
Most certainly I say unto you, he will put him in charge of all of his substance and all of his property. Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I come without delay, and my divine compensation, which includes rewards and punishments, is joining me. I will compensate every man according to his whole way of feeling and acting, including his aims and endeavors. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15. Anything thought about, accomplished, or produced shall become known, for the day shall declare it. And on the day of judgment, it will be, it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test, try, and scrutinize it to see whether it is genuine or not. And if his works do not perish in the fire, which has been built on the foundation already laid, he will receive what is given as a reward, which God bestows upon good deeds and endeavors. And if his accomplishments shall be consumed by the fire, he shall sustain damage, receive injury, and suffer loss. But he himself will receive eternal blessedness in heaven by the saving influence of God. But he will not make it through this large destructive fire without damage. Second Thessalonians 1.11 We pray always for you that our God would judge and deem you worthy of the calling which he has commanded to be given to you. And therefore he sees you fit to obtain the blessings promised in the call. And make complete in everything the things that bring delight to his heart through the working of your faith and the course of conduct that springs forth powerly, powerfully from it. For we all long to hear him say when we stand before him the words in Matthew 25, 23. Well done, servant. You did an excellent job fulfilling the duty and the service demanded. You've shown yourself faithful in transacting business, executing commands, and discharging your office duties over the few things that I have given you. And because you have abided in my promises, enter now into the state of blessedness, which the Lord enjoys. On that day, he's going to sound the trumpet. He's going to sweep away the bride into the hoopah. He's going to unveil us. He's going to purify us with his refining fire. He's going to present us to his Father as a spotless bride, free of accusation. He's going to reward us with praise, glorified bodies, honor the people around us. It's just going to be an amazing, amazing time. We get to be dressed in white. We get to go to the marriage feast. Then we get to be eventually ushered into the new heaven and the new earth where we will live with him eternally. So I wrote a poem a few years back about the day that I got saved as a little girl. I'm going to finish with it. And it is called, well, it's about the day I said yes and married Jesus. Because that's essentially what we're doing when we get saved. We're accepting a marriage proposal from him. So the poem is called The Day. I sat in church as a little girl and I heard them say his name. They said if I'd give my life to him, I'd never be the same. I heard them talk of his sacrifice to pay for all my sin. How he suffered and bled and died for me to cleanse me from within. I heard them talk of the comforter that would live inside of me. If I would give my heart to the one who hung upon the tree, they said I'd be his beautiful bride in my dress with golden trim, and he would make a special trip to take me back with him. <coughs> they talked about our reunion and the joy that it would bring. They said that I would never grow tired of hearing the angels sing. They told me that he loved me more than I could comprehend. He proved it when he died for me and when he rose again. They say he is in heaven preparing for the day when he will return in glory and carry me away. Oh, how could I reject such an offer to hear the angels sing, to walk the streets of purest gold and marry the king of kings? So in my dress of purest pink with ribbons in my hair, I walked up to the altar. My proposal was up there. The congregation stood and cheered. They were making quite a scene, for they knew this cute little princess had just become a queen. <laughs> will be one filled with glory. Yes. But what a glorious day that will be. Yes. It may not be gold, as you have been told, but it's going to last for eternity. Amen. 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 Amen.